Well, you were, do you want to do what you said? Oh. Hi everyone. So for those of you that couldn't hear, my name is Samantha. Um, I'm a trainer here at the Coalition and we've just been joined by Katie, who's also a trainer. And unfortunately, Doreen will be a little bit late. She also had a training this morning, early, early this morning, so she's on her way here. We are talking about mobile advocacy services in the community and we are joined by... Laura Horsley with East Place. Lizzie Kazan with Doves who are going to be doing the bulk of the presentation today. And so we're just going to be here to sit and listen and help facilitate the PowerPoint. Um, if you have any other questions, please let us know. And then we're going to, we're going to get started. So the webinar goals today are to figure out strategies for expanding existing services to incorporate mobile services. Um, flexible access to services that um, needed other than shelter or housing, best practices, and challenges or lessons learned. And I would like to ask um, what concerns you all have or why you're on this webinar, if that's okay, just so that we kind of know like where we're going with the conversation, what your, what your goal is for mobile advocacy before we get started. So if you want to write that down in the chat, that would be really great. Learn more about what mobile advocacy looks like. Great, thank you. Reaching more people within our community. Awesome. Oh, good. Great. Oh, how to use the service in rural communities. That's awesome. Advocacy approach. Well, obviously, approach. That's really great. Thank you so much for writing that down. And if anyone else has anything, just let us know. Okay, so one of the things that's become apparent as the movement has progressed to the 30 year mark is that our clients need a lot more than just emergency housing. In fact, the vast majority of clients don't actually need emergency shelter. Some of them can afford their own shelter, some can live with family for a while and then get a job or continue at their job and get their own place to live. But a lot of them report needing these, what we would call outpatient services. So counseling, case management, lay legal advocacy, some of the other things you see up here so because there were all of these needs that were going unmet, we've started to see a push in the past five to seven years towards development of mobile advocacy or mobile case management services to work with these clients that are not wanting or appropriate for emergency shelter or who can't get into transitional housing yet, but who still need services or need wraparound services to be the most successful in leaving their partners or their perpetrators. So that's what we're gonna be focusing on today when we say mobile services, mobile advocacy, mobile case management, we're talking about those outpatient wraparound services that we can help facilitate. So what we know before we launch into some of the nitty gritties with our guest speakers. So our programs have always been in a state of flux. Funding is always in a state of flux. Um, we need to change our services to actually serve our clients. So when our clients are letting us know that shelter is not all they need, we need to change to meet the needs that they have. We know that change is not always comfortable. Uh, if Doreen was here, she would probably say that one five times, um, <laughs> change is not always comfortable, and that there's going to be resistance from many quarters, especially people who are used to things the way they've always been. So, and I know Laura can talk to that one quite a bit here in a minute. Okay. So where do we start? Recognizing the needs. So we have to actually figure out what the clients need. And the way you do that is by actually going out and asking the clients. And there are a lot of ways you can do that. If you're not sure what to do, you can partner with agencies or with some of the state universities or community colleges 
that do research and ask them the best way to go about doing this, whether it's focus groups or surveys, exit surveys in the programs or uh, wider net surveys that maybe other outpatient programs, um, hotline assessment surveys. There are a lot of ways to do this. And then the key part, though, is this last bullet point. So it's no good doing the surveys if you're not actually going to change anything. Then it's just wasted data and wasted time. So you actually have to be willing to act on what they're telling you they want. So as I said, mobile advocacy is really good at picking up where shelter services stop. There's only so much that can be done in shelter, and when someone leaves shelter, usually all services stop because the person's no longer in shelter. So mobile advocacy services are great because when a person leaves shelter or if they can't make it to shelter, this is where they can step in. Okay, so <clears throat> now we're gonna turn over to our guest speakers for these next slides. Um, talking about the kind of services that their programs provide and then getting into some of the nitty-gritty about their program. Okay, so this is Laura at East Place. Um, so we look at our mobile program as an enhancement to shelter service because we would never advocate that uh, shelter is not a necessary service and certainly we see it every day as um, a service that we help our victims and survivors get to. Um, one of the things that you have to do is really look beyond the partnerships that you've already established or that are comfortable for you. Um, it's really important to look at the community that you're serving in and find out where are people going in that community to, to get information. Is it the food bank? Is it the clinic? Is it the local community center? Is it, um, if you're tribal, is it in the chapter house or in some local other, some other local community? Um, and so really trying to expand where you go to access individuals. Um, and then trying to explain to the community that you are doing something very different. We've been doing this since 2013 and we still have to educate people about mobile advocacy, what it means, why is it necessary, what does it do? And so the answer to that is it does everything shelter does. It just doesn't require them to leave and it doesn't give them a bed. And so we do a lot of the same types of services, case management, we do safety planning, we do a lot of transportation, obviously. Um, we do legal advocacy. In fact, we have an entire legal mobile, a mobile legal department at this point. Um, and we deliver food boxes and basic needs as part of our mobile program. So we pack up our vans every day. Uh, we're taking food boxes, we're taking toiletries, we're taking items that people requested the week before so that we're being able to meet all of their basic needs. And again, expanding that partnership to other community systems. Uh, we do a lot of work with government entities that we never thought we would work with. We're doing a lot more work with police departments, courts, um, simply because it does enhance that service system where people are really afraid or apprehensive of participating by themselves. Yeah. And um, this is Lizzie speaking from Doves. So we serve the 50 plus population and we're Maricopa County only just for a little background. And so um, because of our age specific population that we serve, we saw a lot of gaps in that community. Transportation is the third identified barrier for that community in access, accessing any type of service overall. So you can imagine what that's like for an older victim that has no access to transportation. They can't get to a support group. They can't get to a senior center. They can't get anywhere to get services. Um, and so what we found was we were missing a huge population of older victims that were not getting services at all. They were invisible to us, basically. And so we started in early 2016 with our mobile advocacy person. Um, and <laughs> and started that, and uh, it's it's grown rapidly. And so our mobile advocacy um, program does enhance our services. We have our community support groups, we have transitional housing, but this fills in those gaps in services that we saw. And so we do a lot of case management, a lot of the safety planning, a ton of lay legal advocacy as well. And so what we really found was our numbers have like quadrupled in services. And so we didn't expect such rapid growth, 
which is always important <laughs> to remember. Um, it, you know, if you it's not a section of the population that you're helping, you don't know how big that section is. And so um, it's been a, a incredible learning experience and learning curve for us over at Doves. And so we really um, value this, this service and this program. Cool. Okay, so Laura was already alluding to the stuff on this slide a minute ago. So do you want to start with this one then, since you were already kind of hinting? Sure. sure. So um, our program, like Lizzie mentioned, um, kind of exploded as well. We doubled the first year and we've quadrupled this this last past year, serving over 3,000 individuals in our mobile programs. We actually have programs in uh, Maricopa County. Uh, we are also in a rural program out of Quartzsite, and we run a tribal program out of uh, Cayenta, Arizona. So one of the things that we really had to do was take a look at who we had and what we had. So looking at resources that we had on the day that we decided to launch our mobile program um, looked very different than the resources that we had looked at or needed when we were operating shelter only. And so really looking at um, were the staff ready for the level of commitment that it took to, to run mobile? Um, did we have the leadership in place? And one of the things that I will tell you is we didn't. Um, we did not realize how much more um, everything it was going to take to really run the mobile program. And so our leadership has always existed of a two-member management team, and so um, trying to manage multiple mobile advocates every day, and now in three different locations, uh, we kind of got a blaring wake-up call one day and said, gosh, you know, this is way too much for two people. So really thinking about that as you go forward, and I think as Lizzie mentioned too, this program really does take off. Once you get those first initial referrals under your belt and you start feeling comfortable, you'll see that more and more people access. Um, board members, I happen to be in a very good place. Um, each place has a very progressive board. Uh, one of their main things was to set up as kind of a gap provider. They wanted to do the things that other programs couldn't or didn't. Um, so I didn't really get a lot of feedback or a lot of um, resistance from them. Um, they were really more concerned about how are we going to re-educate the community because realizing that shelter is the recognized service delivery system um, they knew that that was going to create some problems, that we were going to lose some support, and, and that was real. We did and still have. Um, and then talking to funders, kind of looking at, okay, so here's what we do, here's how we can fit within the confines of what you're paying for, and here's how we can provide those same ancillary services and primary services that we've always done, just in a different modality. And so that's kind of how we looked at um, the overall picture of preparing and being ready for the mobile advocacy program. Yeah, and for Doves, we we started with our our um, internal leadership, getting that buy-in. That was a process um, because we've been doing community support groups and transitional housing for over 15 years. So that was what we knew. That's what we were good at. That's what we were comfortable with. <laughs> and so getting the leadership to really believe that this is a service our community needs and it's, it is also the future of social services overall. It's where we're moving. Um, and so getting that buy-in was really important. So once we got the leadership on board, our, our board members um, are really supportive. They, they know that we're in the trenches, so our board is always supportive of our, our new ideas or where we're going. And so they were cheerleaders on the side. And then um, the funders, I mean, it's, I know in this last funding cycle, mobile was number one. So, you know, our funders are, are seeing that shift in um, that service mod modality change. So getting that is really important. Um, and then remembering that for the team that's providing the services, communication is number one. You're not seeing these people at the office every day, you're not in a shelter setting every day, you might not see a coworker in your day, you might only see clients. And so making sure that you are communicating with the supervisor so that they're up to date and know what's going on, as well as you have a sense of community amongst the team so you're not feeling like you're out there in the ocean all by yourself floating away is, is really, really important. Okay. 
This sounds like stuff you were already talking about, how you broach the subject with your board members, with staff. Mm -hmm. okay. Were there any other prompts that seemed to work for you guys besides what's up here? Well, I know for doves, I, I really took from our um, Arizona State kind of area plan, which looks at aging services overall. Um, and looked at the gaps that aging services are seeing, not just victim-specific <coughs> services. And I used that to kind of help push the idea of, well, these are gaps that the aging services overall is having. It's definitely a gap that we're having here in victim services. So Transportation, mobility. Yeah, transportation, not being able to get to a place, access to services. Um, so I really used that when I was pitching mobile. Yeah, us too. Transportation being a huge barrier. <laughs> Did you have naysayers? Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. No, that won't work. We don't want to do that. Oh man, still to this day, we're still uh, hearing it. Yeah, I mean, in in writing for upcoming grants, I. I was consistently asked, do you really have like enough work for new staff? Do you really? I was like, yes, mm -hmm. yes, we so do. The numbers are important. All right, numbers are huge. You've got to be able to show that. And it's, you know, it's unfortunately, I, for, for in my experience, um, we don't necessarily prepare before there's a problem. We're more yeah. catching up when there yeah. is a problem. And so it's when we're maxing out on our numbers served and we can't possibly get another person in to get services and that's when, you know, it's like, oh, sure, and now you've shown to me we can get another staff person. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's, and that's true for us too. You have to have numbers. Mm -hmm. People are driven by numbers. Um, when we first started, we were taking everybody. Um, so we had, I think we started off with three advocates and so we were just taking everybody because we were so uh, excited and nervous about what this was going to look like. We had no idea how much service they were going to need, what, that, what time commitment. Mm -hmm. And so we were taking everybody and at one point in time we were looking at timesheets and we've got people working 55, 60 hours and we're looking at why is that happening every week and it's because that's 65, 70 people. Um, and so realizing that we couldn't serve everyone, having to then look at what's a reasonable caseload. Um, you know, in shelter, it's kind of already predetermined. You have this many beds, that's what you need, and here's, here's your staff ratio, and here's what you do. Um, and so we've just been kind of riding along by the seat of our pants, if you will, to just kind of figure it out. And so we've kind of settled on about 40, depending upon the level of uh, need in each caseload. We have some flexibility to move, you know, people around one, person may carry 45, one may be at 25, depending on the level of need. And none of that stuff were things that we really anticipated. And so when people were saying, oh, this will never work, it will never work, yeah, it was working. We were taking calls every day. We were signing people up and then realizing that, gosh, we would kind of gotten a little ahead of ourselves. So making sure that you're methodical in your process, making sure that you think about these things. And don't be afraid to, to reach out and talk mm -hmm. to Lizzie or myself or anybody else doing mobile. You know, we can certainly point you in directions on where to get numbers from, um, and I'm sure Lizzie, as much as we are, are more than happy to share some of the process that we've gone through and some of the number differences that we've seen from year to year. So, do you have anything? Nope. <clears throat> so you guys have already been building on that first one pretty well, but now we get into some of the logistical nitty gritties. So you want to tackle any of those? Where are you getting your vehicles? Also at Doves, we still use our personal vehicle. <laughs> ah, okay. So that's that's where we are. Um, if we have um, specific needs for for an agency vehicle, we do have access to an agency van or an agency pickup truck. But predominantly, it's our personal vehicle that we're we're using to get from A to B. I think that's kind of the predominant way that people are doing it, especially when they're starting out. Um, we were very fortunate. We had enough vans in our shelter program when we retooled our folks to give them each a van. Um, and now having started it that way and looking at options of providing mileage in people's cars, I don't think that I would ever feel comfortable doing it any other way. I think it's really important for agencies to make the commitment 
to provide people with the tools. And one of the tools that is part of mobile advocacy is a vehicle that's maintained, has the proper insurance, has the proper liability, um, because it's not just our advocates that are mobile, it's our, our clients are mobile. So we not only go see them, we take them wherever they need to go. Some of our best appointments take place inside our vehicle and the way from one place to another one. Um, and some of them are spending an entire day with one individual making sure that they're getting through the court system. I would hate to have to think about what that would do financially for my staff to have to keep the liability insurance levels that we're required to have. Um, and so, you know, we make sure that we're keeping track of the mileage and maintenance and, and everything is done on time. And, and more importantly, when our advocates drive their office into the parking lot at the end of the day, they're done for the day. They can leave that vehicle, they can walk in, they can dump out their stuff, and they can go home and they can have their life. Um, we also look at it as a safety concern. We don't want somebody out in the community being followed back um, to wherever they live, um, being able to recognize, oh, you are the person that my significant other is meeting with every, every time she disappears, and here's your car, and now I'm going to follow you home, and now I know where you live. And so we really looked at it from a lot of different standpoints. And so we got our vehicles predominantly from VOCA. Um, I know we were kind of a big conversation topic for a little while. Um, but it, it is a process. And, and that advocate has to have that vehicle associated with them. Um, some of our advocates don't even have personal vehicles, and so you know, it's important for them to have the tools that they need when they walk out. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not there yet. We're not there yet. <laughs> um, what about, so we talked about relationship building in kind of a general sense, but mm -hmm. were there any non-traditional partners that you could do extra things to partner with? to convince them to partner with you or deal with confidentiality concerns or something like that? I know for Doves, I mean, a lot of it was just education on what mobile advocacy is and okay. what that service looks like. I mean, you say it and here in, you know, the domestic violence, sexual violence service world, we know what that means. Mm -hmm. But a senior center staff worker doesn't know what that is. A resident manager at a housing complex doesn't know what that is. So it's a lot of education on what that looks like and what that service can be for their clients that they're serving, that they identify might need some assistance. So that was a lot of the relationship building that, that does did and has continued to do. Well, and, and one step further than that, yes. Some partners do require that you do extras. Um, we have several partner locations that allow us to drop in and see clients there because maybe it's kind of a convenient location, maybe we have somebody needs to do paperwork, um, they want data. So you have to track their data separately. So some of, one of our partners happens to be the City of Surprise. And so one of the things that they want to know is, is in, in their location that they provide to us, how many surprise people are being seen there and how many non-surprise people. And so there's a tracking tool that has to be developed for that. Um, some of them um, wanted to be assured that if there was a situation that we were going to have a backup plan. So we had to do safety planning with the partner location before we were able to begin service. Um, one of our partner locations will not allow our advocates in with a person unless they have a second person so that they have uh, some kind of a sense of safety. You know, they're, they're feeling that apprehension about bringing victims to their program and those potential perpetrators following them. So you know, we had to really look at, and we've had to turn, we've had to not continue relationships with people because the demands became so great that it became burdensome to us to be able to provide those things. But really a lot of it is just data and reassurance that you have a plan, that you have a process. Um, some of them have been extremely wonderful. I know one location that we have actually gave us a back office where there's a back door so that the person came in one way and could leave a totally different way if they needed to. So really understood and embraced um, that as a part of their service provisions too. So we've had both, you know, positive and negative. And then confidentiality with mobile case management. So files, client information. Well, <clears throat> transportation of files and confidentiality is very well laid out in the Arizona Service Standards. <laughs> if you uh, are wondering, I would definitely read that. Um, it's a nice, hefty, locked, rolling case like, like a lawyer would have. It's what it looks like. It's 
they get, we do combination locks, mm -hmm. so that way there's no missing keys or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, and they, you know, files can't stay overnight. They need to leave the vehicle um, every day and in a locked case. Um, we actually do not allow our mobile advocates to take the files outside the building. Um, we created a thing called a shadow file. And so we have just specific information like a safety, tra a safety plan tracking sheet. Um, and I think there's uh, one other tracking sheet that's in there. And then they keep their referral log in there so that they know where they've referred people to. Um, and then we code those with client numbers so that there's no way that people can recognize mm -hmm. um, any, anybody in there. But again, the locking rolling tote, yes. uh, definitely. <laughs> a, yes. and, and you can't tote it because it's <laughs> too heavy. <laughs> uh, make sure it has wheels because that yeah. was another mistake that we did when we first began. We, we did not provide one with wheels. Um, so certainly a, ne a necessary part of the, of the package. And staff qualities. Qualities for your case management. Those are on some upcoming slides this year. Oh, I see. <laughs> so I think we've been talking about staff. Is there anything else in the relationship building piece that you want to add that wasn't covered? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. And some non traditional partners. Mm -hmm. You mentioned almost all of these. Are there any other non-traditional that you found to be really helpful that aren't up here? On the reservation, the chart, the chapter houses are very good um, sources of support. And in the rural communities, we're having a lot of really good luck with um, local offices like the ES and WIC. Um, so a lot of them have like a meeting room. They're willing to let us see their folks there. So uh, we've been pretty fortunate to have them. Any for you, Lizzie, that aren't up here? Um, we do a lot with um, HUD housing. Ah, okay. So a lot of, you know, the government-funded housing, Section 8 and senior subsidized housing, we do a lot with that, okay. with those programs. We already talked about the vehicle thing mm -hmm. pretty well. We just talked about that. that. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> So it says draining under okay. the heart there. Yeah. Draining. Yeah. So it, it is a very different type of service delivery. Um, you know, in shelter, we we could kind of take people and train them because we were all in the same place. Everybody was in the same building. They could learn from the people around them. Um, so the superstars, we kind of matched with the with the new folks, and we did all the great stuff. But out here, it's it's difficult um, because. As Lizzie mentioned, you're out there all by yourselves. So from a management level, it's terrifying to think about, you know, I see my staff for probably 30 minutes at the beginning of the day as they're loading up and they're getting all of their things together. And I don't see them again until they're rolling in at the end of the night if I happen to still be there at 8.30 when our last person's rolling back in for the day. And so I have no idea what's happening out there, so you, you have to really be mindful and pick people who are able to be completely isolated and alone for the majority of their work week. Um, there are times when our folks don't see each other for the entire week. Uh, we've instituted a thing where we only see clients Monday through Thursday. Friday is an in-the-office day to do notes, to do all of their group stuff, to get ready for the next week, to make their appointments, and then to have that staff time because they really do have to be able to staff clients, be able to talk about resources, with their peers and to have that time. And so you have to have somebody that is already familiar with domestic violence. It's not for somebody new off the street that has no idea what it, what it means. You have to have somebody who is not afraid to drive and drive and drive. <laughs> and, and you have to have somebody that can lift at least 25 pounds mm -hmm. because they have to, that rolling tote has to go from rolling to the car to into the car. Mm -hmm. um, they have to not only carry it, but their laptop and their purse and their lunch box and their, and their donation boxes and whatever else that happens to be part of their day. And so it really is a very difficult job for the advocates. Um, and, and then making sure that you build in some kind of self-care for them. Um, we went to a process of actually creating a room in our building um, for that downtime. So really making sure that they can just come in after a bad day and just kind of hang out in the, in the relaxation room 
and, and be able to debrief. And so, and then as Lizzie said, also communication throughout the day. We do a lot of texting, we do a lot of emailing, and so technology has definitely got to be your friend. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say um, some other staff qualities would be a self-starter. I think that's the next slide. Next one. Yeah, so definitely motivated and um, a self-starter because it is going to be um, very much you need to be able to take things and roll with it and, and make decisions on your own some of the time. And so you want somebody that's really got those skills honed and doesn't need to check in for every single decision because that's, that's going to be a time suck. Um, and I, I mean, I got to say, the physically draining thing is so important because I, after my first year doing this, I, I had some back problems that came up because of sitting in my car driving all, all the time. So you got to really make sure to build in that self-care piece and make sure, you know, stretching, talking about that, stretching, taking a minute um, because you are just driving all the time, so much driving. Yeah, someone left and someone's just coming. Oh, okay. yeah. And then Lana asked, how about coalitions? When we were talking about partners. Oh. <clears throat> well, that's helpful in Maricopa County. Um, we have a great relationship with the Arizona Coalition, of course. Um, we have worked some with, um, there's a, a feeding and hunger coalition on the Navajo Nation, and so we've done some work with them. Uh, we're really open to partner with anybody. You know, we've never not had a conversation about partnering, and um, would be willing to talk with anyone willing to participate. Yeah. Thank you. How many advocates do each of your programs have now? So <clears throat> we're still at one, but we're hiring another right now, so it just hasn't happened yet. And then um, we typically have a clerk that is part of our mobile, from, from one of the universities that's part of our mobile program. So. We have 12 full-time advocates, and we have a staff of six, six aides that assist with transportation to group, transportation to appointments, um, they also do child care, so mom or dad can participate in their services. So we have a mobile child care person that goes out and does that, so mom or dad can participate. Um, go to court, um, so we have a toy tote uh, that, we, oh. that we keep in our vehicles from ages 5 to 18. And so uh, we make sure that everybody has something to do, um, so and definitely could use more. So More advocates? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's your caseload, Lizzie? It should be about 40. Um, I, I just did annual numbers, and my caseload was running more at like 75. You need another advocate. Yes. 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 Yeah, you should, not, you should really not start this program with one person. Even if you're just starting it, the, the demand is going to go so much quicker than you think. I mean, I really thought when we started the, the mobile piece, that our first year would be slow. It was maybe the first three months that were slow when people learned, and then it was a huge spike in, in demand. And so I would really recommend starting the program with at least two mobile people so that, A, you have people that are learning from each other alongside instead of somebody just kind of doing it on their own, and then, B, just once the demand grows so quickly, you, you have some balance there. Any other lessons learned? As good as you learn. That's right. Um, uh, so that's kind of a visual of how our program works. Um, we go everywhere, the mountains, the rural areas. And somebody had asked earlier about how to run mobile in rural. Um, it's, it's a totally different animal um, and a lot more challenging. And so. As Lizzie mentioned, we too believe and strongly advocate that you have at least two people, maybe an advocate and an aide, so that aide can help out with some of the 
uh, behind the scenes tasks, if, if, even if you have to. But it's even more difficult in rural because of the, of the way invoicing is handled through some of the funding. Um, it's only direct service time that, that is counted in, in how you bill for DES dollars. And so if you're not seeing somebody, you're not able to bill for those, that time. And so to have two people up front can be very, very difficult. Um, and then making sure that if you've got somebody in the rural area, as, if they're not seeing a client, they're doing outreach. They're talking to people, they're going and passing out flyers, brochures, business cards, whatever it is that you do. Um, making sure that you're just saturating that entire community where everybody in town knows who you are and knows who that advocate is. And when they see her getting out of the van, they know she's bringing her stuff and, and they're going to feel that need to start sending people. Um, you have to earn your time and, and that's a difficult thing. Um, we probably experienced the most pushback from the rural and tribal components of our program. Um, simply because we have, to, we have to earn the time and people want to see that it really does make a difference before they're really willing to invest and to start making those referrals. It's even more important that you partner with out of the ordinary partnerships, get places that will let you come in and, and just be there during some of their busy times. We started out in food banks. You get a lot of individuals who go to food banks and so you have kind of a captive audience just passing out your flyer. We ended up getting people that you know, gave it to their mom, their sister, their whoever, and we got referrals that way. But it is very slow to build in those types of um, surroundings. And so you have to go in it knowing that you have to be patient and that you have to be diligent. Every single minute has to be engaged in either recruiting or maintaining those relationships with your existing clients. And so um, if you can't do it with two people, then just have a very motivated self-starting individual that can kick that off for you in the rural area. And you know, if we can help out, we certainly are willing to do so. And Olivia had a couple good suggestions as far as um, location, child support office and hospital. And I know that our, the child support offices might be more receptive because they're experiencing an increase in awareness about domestic violence through some training and stuff that we're doing with them. And, I know that a lot of the offices would appreciate, you know, having advocates available. So that might be an idea if you're trying to expand in some um, communities. Is check out the talk to the supervisor of the child support office. Absolutely. Just added on the colleges. Colleges. Mm -hmm. Community colleges that might have more non-traditional students. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Olivia. Some of the ideas that you guys come up with and how you how you are safe. Yes. Avon books. Yes. So um, I know one of the biggest things for for me and my experience with Doves is dress code. I am the most casually dressed person at our agency, um, and people are always like, "Why does Lizzie get to dress down every day?" It's because I'm out in the community and I can't look like I'm from the government or that I'm a, a social worker or something. I need to look like, an, you know, an average person, like a mom meeting with another mom or an Avon lady selling books or whatever. Um, so, you know, dress code is really important to make sure that you're, you're meeting your clients kind of on the same level as well as you're blending with the community. I know that that was a big um, shift change for us at the agency. Um, uh, another piece is really making sure that we talk about um, safety planning before the, the first meeting actually takes place. So with the client making sure that we talk about taking a different route to the meeting place if they're meeting me somewhere, you know, that the abuser is not around or whatever that looks like, really safety planning with that. And then um, for first meetings, because um, doves can provide services in home if safe. Um, so for first meetings, we do meet in a more public or a staff, you know, specific place. and. Um, if the risk lethality is very, very high, then uh, two people go. Mm -hmm. Double it up, buddy system. <laughs> well, and some of the other things that we've put into place is uh, we call them shift reports. Um, so at the end of every day, every advocate and every aide has to tell us 
what did you do during that day so that we can kind of keep track of where they're going. We collect data that way. What partners are working? What locations are the, are the best? Which ones are not getting any kind of people coming? Um, and then we ask them to then project out or tell us what is on their schedule for the next day. Um, because we don't believe that you should ever leave an appointment before you have your next appointment scheduled so that you're making sure that you show that vested interest in that, that client's life and what's happening for them. And so um, where are you going to be tomorrow? What are your locations? And who is, you know, what is the first name of the person that you're going to see? So that we have a visual that, okay, everybody's home for the day. This is where they've been today, and this is where they're going to be. And so we know if somewhere in the course of a day we've lost track of somebody, we know where we can go to try to find them. And so we instituted that a long time ago. The other thing that we did um, <laughs> is we track our vehicles. Uh, we put on a GPS tracking device, um, and, and for lots of reasons. For one, it's accountability for the staff. But more so than that, it's accountability for the vehicle. So wherever that car is, you know that advocate and that client, wherever they are, they're going to be somewhere around that location. And so it really gives us an opportunity to um, kind of see where they're going, see when they leave. Um, one of the great things about our tracking device is that you can set up areas. So like on the Navajo Nation, there's a couple of zones that we don't have cell service. Um, there's a couple of areas where it's extremely dangerous for people to be out and about, even in pairs. And, and so we can set up what is, what is called a geofence. And so we get an alert on our phone every time somebody enters that area and then we get the alert when they've exited so that we know that they are safely in and safely out. Um, and so making sure that we kind of keep track. Um, it also allows us to look at what is their mileage, are there, is it time for the oil change, is it time for some of those things. So it keeps up with the, with the vehicle's messaging. Um, and so, you know, part of that commitment to make sure that vehicle is always in good operational order and that we know where people are and that they're safe. A good use of technology. A good use of technology, <laughs> yes. So, and then making sure that we provide agency phones, not personal cell phones for our staff because we don't want them to have client information in their personal phones and, and vice versa. So rather than make it all sticky, we just make them carry two phones. So uh, then we can manage and maintain what information goes into that agency phone. We make sure that they're not putting identifiable information in the phone. They're giving all their clients nicknames so that they know which phone numbers go to which client um, to really make sure that it's, it's safe and that that client's information never goes home with that individual. So. No, it's just one of the things that somebody brought up as far as, you know, having an Avon book on hand or a Bible on hand or a recipe on hand just in case a family member or a perpetrator comes upon this meeting. So you can say, oh, just sharing recipes or just a Bible study or mm -hmm. I'm an Avon lady, whatever. Mm -hmm. oh. So these as safety measures, so maintaining a vehicle, right, so it doesn't break down someplace when you're stranded, right. cell phone coverage. I think um, last time the, the service you had for the van, that tracking, mm -hmm. was that through Verizon mm -hmm. last time? Okay. Yes. And is that also who your work cell phones are through? Um, everywhere but the Navajo Nation. The Navajo <laughs> Nation has its own separate cell service oh, okay. um, through Cellular One. Okay. Um, because Verizon still has a lot of dropped areas on the reservation. So. And then making sure that you have a safe word. So if our advocate is out in the community and they're meeting with somebody, maybe even the client themselves is escalating, maybe they're having some kind of a, a, a problem, we have a safe word that we've instituted internally so the advocate can say, you know what, let me check on my supervisor. Let me see if I can take care of this for you. She calls, uses the safe word we know. Let's find out where that person is. And let's, and let's dispatch resources to her. So, you know, making sure that you, have, you think about all of the different types of safety. Um, Karen, I'm not sure what you mean there. Like when, so when you were out on an APS follow-up, the perp was there? Is that what you mean? Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They show up, they stop by. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They follow them. And you're both like, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. so that's happened. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, we've had advocates followed. So they just drive into the first police department that they find and So we talked about some of those lessons learned. Yes, it's good to have backup. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah. All right. Thank you, Karen. And we can't we can never talk about safety too much, whether mm -hmm. it's for the person we're serving, whether it's mm -hmm. in the community in general, or certainly for staff. So always keep that at the forefront of your discussions. Well, and in some ways, mobile advocates have less safety built in than shelter folks. Yeah, right. You know, your surrounded shelters become fortresses over mm -hmm. the course of time, and you know, you're out in a car. Yeah. You know? And so <laughs> you're doing some walking and doing some of those things. And so mm -hmm. we encourage our advocates to find different places to meet so that they're not going to the same place all the time consistently. We do have some sites that we have guaranteed to have office hours. Um, as part of that partner uh, responsibility, um, but we do ch we do tell them change it up. You know, take a different route, pick a different park, pick a different area, just to make sure. Because we can't afford armored Humvees. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> no. so we'll continue to work on Boca. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll continue to work on Boca. All right. So. so this is kind of a wrap up on the lessons learned. If you guys want to address any of those things? Well, I know something that I did, we didn't mention um, is kind of using resources you have available to help um, support your, your advocates. Interns are an amazing resource, and they can help with doing a lot of the time-consuming research for different resources or um, working on different applications that are very time-consuming so that you get more one-on-one -on -one time with your client instead of you spending an hour looking for a housing facility, your intern could do that, and they're still getting some, you know, that experience. And so that's been a huge help for me in doing some of that research and, and referral research for some of my clients is, is huge. And I think Laura addressed this earlier that not everyone will welcome you or embrace this idea, but I, I think it's really important that we work as hard as we can to develop a relationship with other agencies and and let them know that we're not trying to compete for their um the population they're working with but how can we work with you to fill in the gaps and do stuff that you might not be able to do in the confines of your program or your funding and and that is something that for doves we do because we work with the 50 plus population that's where our expertise is so we partner with our local domestic violence shelters and work with the case manager that's assigned to that person in shelter and ensure that they're getting the support and that older victim is getting hooked up with the right services that are more geared for their needs um, and so I, I've gone into multiple shelters and worked with the case manager there to help help with that case management of that older victim. And that's a lot of the feedback that I've gotten about mobile advocacy is is how good, if, if you can develop that relationship, how good it, the outcomes are as far as filling in all of those gaps, enhancing the services that they're already getting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that we've been able to do is transport victims between shelters. Comtrans will only do the initial, but they won't transport between shelters. So if somebody's found in one location and have to go somewhere else. So having our mobile advocates and our aides available for transports uh, most of the time, uh, we've been able to connect people. So taking them from one safe place to another one, or even getting them out of an area. We had a request for a person in Tucson needing to get to Flagstaff. And so our mobile advocates did a relay. We sent one to Tucson to pick up, and then they brought them back to Phoenix or somebody else took that person and then transported to Flagstaff so that they could get to that safe place. And so being able to really recognize that it isn't just one, even, even in mobile, it isn't just one set of services that you provide. It is all of that part of that victim's need that becomes then part of what you're tasked to, to manage and to maintain. And so if we can offer somebody a safe ride, we're going to do that for them. They have a trained advocate. They can talk about safety but while they're going. Some of our advocates talk about um, with their clients, we get somebody into shelter. And instead of calling Comtrans, we take them to the drop-off point and say, this is what to expect. This is what you want to take with you. So helping that victim be 
you know, better prepared to go into shelter or to be in a, a place that's foreign or different. Um, and, and I think it really goes back to the the whole concept of victim advocacy as it started 40 years ago when we had to be at our most flexible and most creative. And, and I think we need to maintain that and or get back to that because then we're we're able to meet more victims' needs and and not just get stuck in a rut on this is these are the only services we do and this is the only way we do it. But like that relay thing, that's right. that's simple but in, ingenious right. to to be flexible enough to be able to provide that relay to make sure a person can get from point A to point B, um, just with a little cooperation and planning. Right. Well, it's a nice way for agencies to work together. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of shelters don't have the resources to send somebody out, pick up a yeah. client if somebody's not available. And so, you know, we can't always in every situation, but we do as often as possible allow that call to happen and we tell them, you know, get on the road, do what you got to do. Um, and so it's a great way to help those partners to really feel like you're not competition. You know, I certainly don't ever want to go back to doing shelter. I truly commend the people that stick it out and continue to do it every day. That is not my cup of tea at this point in my life anymore, but I certainly want to enhance and to, to make it easier for those who do shelter to get people where they need to be. And so we've even taken individuals from shelter to a court appointment and stayed with them because they didn't have somebody to do that. Um, so realizing that you really can be completely outside of the box and outside of that daily rigid structure and you can give those individuals the time and attention that they truly need. And with any other healthy relationship, whether it's with your coworkers or with your community partners and other agencies, and certainly with the victims and survivors that we serve, the consistency and the follow through is, is really important. I mean, say what you do and do what you say and just follow through and mm -hmm. be consistent. Yeah, I mean, the last five minutes of any case management appointment is talking about the next appointment. So, I mean, that's that's really important to make sure that we're never just leaving them hanging. Um, and I know something that I don't think that I mentioned, but a lot of the individuals served through our program are people that are still living in the abusive situation and who have identified leaving is not an option for them. Okay. So that's really throwing in flexibility and, and making sure you're meeting the individual where they are at in their process. Um, and, you know, minds can always change. I, I worked with an individual for over a year that decided leaving was now an option for her. So you never know what's going to happen in that person's life or in that person's mind, but making sure that you're able to have them living the safest life possible in, in that oh, often safe unsafe, life. yeah, unsafe situation is really important. And that flexibility is really important to have. Right. And, that, and that making them feel like leaving is the only option that they have. You know, right. they, they have to know that you're going to see them whether they leave or they don't. Um, that you're going to continue to be creative mm -hmm. and find those spots because they really do need to know that you're there before, during, and after. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Cool. Okay. Any questions or comments from anyone? Did we get to everyone's curiosity that we talked about in the beginning? We'll give it a couple minutes. See what what you come up with. Do you guys use any of the safety apps like Kite String or Be Safe or any of them? Okay. Not yet. Okay. Kite String. I'll have to check that one out. Oh, that one's one of my favorites. Yeah. Kite String. When I did mobile case management, I did. Because KiteStream is a pre-program, so you time it. So it's at the end of your appointment, if you don't check in, it texts you, hmm. hey, you haven't checked in, everything good? And if you don't reply in five minutes, it sends your message to the contacts you pre-selected. Huh. Oh, neat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's an automated. Yeah. And then Be Safe is just the Go button one, where you can like click the app on your phone and hit the button. It sends the message out. So that's like a panic button, and KiteStream is a pre-programmed. See, we've got two questions. Um, 
Karen says, is there certain agencies that help start mobile units? <laughs> well, EDSI has designed and developed a kind of a training program for people who want to do mobile. Um, we also have an internal mobile advocate training um, system that we have in place. So if you're interested in doing some more work around mobile advocacy and you want somebody to kind of help you uh, figure it out, you could certainly give us a call and we'd, we'd be happy to, to meet with you and see if there's anything that we can do to help out. Ta -da. Can we move? Oh, no, we can't. And Olivia says, if anyone needs help or information on outreach, I'd be happy to help. Can we put Lizzie's email in the chat box, Katie? Sure. Cover. Any other questions, comments? They will automatically be redirected to the survey when we end this. Please fill it up. Jackson says, thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, guys. And this has been recorded. It will be posted to the YouTube channel by the end of the week. Samantha and Jennifer both say thank you. So refer um, other people that might be interested, coworkers that couldn't attend. Um, we'll have this up on the YouTube channel, like Katie said, soon. So take care. <laughs>